Hello, and welcome to the Daily Bible Podcast with Trisha and Michelle. We're just two friends reading through the Bible chronologically and encouraging you to do the same. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook, Daily Bible Podcast, or go to our website, dailybiblepodcast.net. We are going through the one-year chronological Bible, and we have links for that in our show notes and also at our website. And we also have a Facebook group. Look for Daily Bible Podcast in the Facebook communities, and we would love to connect with you there. Yes, most definitely. I love hanging out in that community. It's such a great community. Okay, so today we are reading 1 Kings 11, 2 Chronicles 9, verses 29 through 31, and Ecclesiastes. We're starting Ecclesiastes, a new book. Whoop, whoop. Mm. And we are reading the first 11 verses of chapter 1. Michelle, things were going so well with Solomon. Uh, we've, we've, been, we've been reading about his wisdom and all the wealth, mm. all the worthy pursuits, but there's mm-hmm. been a dark cloud looming. And why is Solomon turns very dumb as he is led astray by the women in his life? You're like, come on, you were doing so well. Which is... Which I've got to say, as as I'm reading it this way, when we had Proverbs sitting up there and talking about the adulterous woman, and now all of a sudden we have this going on in his life, I'm like, did you not learn from yourself? <laughs> what is, yeah. Like, did you not listen? Yeah. So. You were wise, but yeah. Uh, yeah, not so wise. So he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So how could, how could one man keep up with that? I don't even, yeah, it's like, but remembering their names, I don't know. It's an unbelievable number of marriage partners. So those wives, so the 700, they were considered like princesses. They're part of the royal family, but the concubines, they were basically legal partners without the same standing as the wives. So you even had 700 and then there's these other 300 that are just kind of there legally, but they don't even have, they're not even considered royal. Um, and, but his wives included foreign wives from nations that God forbade the Israelites to marry. Mm-hmm. But he was marrying them. And because he was marrying them, the wives inspired Solomon to worship their gods and to build high places for their idols. So God was furious, which, of course, like, <laughs> you know, after David's heart and Solomon started out so well, um, he ordered that, you know, God ordered the Israelites to only worship him. And it said in 1 Kings 11.10, although he had forbade Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So, of course, Solomon's disobedience angered God, and God declared that he would tear away the kingdom, and Solomon's descendants would not be on the throne and then, except for one tribe. Would, they would lose the kingdom because he had turned away from God and worshipped other gods. And so God allowed, it said finally, he allowed Solomon's descendants to keep one tribe for the sake of David. And so I think that was just such a shows you God just really cherished that relationship with David. So mm-hmm. God wanted to say like, none of your sons and I'm going to tear it away. But then he's like, Oh, but David, okay. You could, you can stay on the throne of one tribe. And so we also learn about Solomon's adversaries. There's Hadite, the Edomite, Rezon, the son of Elida and Solomon's official Jeroboam and both Jeroboam and David, now, we're appointed to follow God after disobedient kings, but David waited upon the Lord to make the throne clear, and God blessed his reign. And Jeroboam, which we'll see, did not wait on the Lord, and he made his own way to the throne, and God did not bless his reign. Mm-hmm. And then when we get into Chronicles, um, it mentions Nathan's records, Adonijah, the Shilonite's prophecy, and Ida's visions concerning Jeroboam, and then Solomon ruled for 40 years, and then he was buried in David's city after resting with his father, and Rehoboam became king. So I just hate that he started off so well, and then just went downhill, and then he's known, like, when you're buried, it's like, oh yeah, he was great, but uh, look what happened afterwards. And I kind of, it's sad that after all this, that's what Solomon's known for. It is. It 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 is so sad because until until this time that we've read through, mm-hmm. and again, it's set up differently. Chronolo- when we're reading chronologically, we're allowed to read timeline and not right. just sections. And kings, 
sort of leaves out some little bit of the um, the coloring, I should mm-hmm. say. And Chronicles wraps up and says, hey, this this is good. This is what happened. There's just a little bit more detail in Chronicles. Right. So when we're reading together like this, we're seeing an entire beautiful story unfold. And I'm like, this man was so incredible. Mm-hmm. And it helped me just see a different part of Solomon. Yeah. But then it's like, oh, because we spent more time in the great age of Solomon. Right. And who he was and this wisdom man and how he really did sort of put Israel on the map, on the world mm-hmm. map. He was such an incredible guy. And then all of a the sudden, these wives, as God has said in the past, these wives brought him down yeah. and it's just it's sad. Okay. Well, Solomon at the end of his life wrote the book Ecclesiastes and we're going to start the first few verses of Ecclesiastes and we're following up our time in Proverbs. So even though we went back to the Kings, remember we just finished up, well, not all of Proverbs, but a good portion of Proverbs. And so we're really putting all that we learned about mm-hmm. wisdom to a test yes. in Ecclesiastes. It is a beautiful book, but it's also kind of a dark and broody book. And it's trying to deconstruct everything you thought you knew and learned. We learned in, in Proverbs, we learned things like watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. And we could easily walk away from Proverbs and believe that if we do good, good things will happen Mm -hmm. to us. But remember, we we mentioned um, Proverbs is also probabilities because one plus one equals two in math, but that doesn't always equal that in life. And that is because, well, we live in a fallen world and Satan is roaming around and bad things do happen. Hence, life is random and uncontrollable, uncontrollable at times. And that's what Ecclesiastes is showing us. This book answers the questions that we might find ourselves in places in life when it is difficult and hard to believe that God is good Mm -hmm. and that he does have our best in mind. What if the problem, but here's, here's one thing I was thinking about as I I'm sorry, I had to read the whole book because I just, I really do like it. <laughs> you was like, I guess, I, I actually do like it too. Um, it, yeah, you have to see what's going to happen. Like, is it just going to be questions? I don't know. Yeah, I know. And, and, and it's like, is, is this really, is the problem, what if the problem isn't God? I mean, unfortunately, sometimes that's where we look. We go, God, why did you do this to me? Yeah. But maybe it's about my expectations. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the teacher's basic med message here is hevel, hevel. So most translations translate hevel, this word, to meaningless. And so that's what we saw today was meaningless. But meaningless doesn't truly capture the meaning of this Hebrew word hevel or even its idea. Hevel is a vapor or a smoke. And there is a little bit of that imagery in these first 11 verses. But the teacher uses this word hevel 38 times in the book as a metaphor to describe life is temporary and fleeting. It's Mm -hmm. like a wisp of smoke. And secondly, life is an enigma or a paradox. So like smoke, it looks solid, like like a cloud. You just look Mm -hmm. up and you're like, hey, that's a cloud. But when you try to grab onto it, there's nothing there. Yeah. And life seems to be going along really well. And then all of a sudden tragedy happens. And, and, and we think that life is so unpredictable and unstable, like nothing's there And the teacher or other translations say it's the preacher is going to help us see what life is really about when we are grasping Mm. at straws. So I'm excited. I, I love just diving into Ecclesiastes. We are going to learn a lot in Ecclesiastes. I really like that book too. And I love how it, it is that, that vapor. Um, sometimes we think that, that, you know, oh, if I just do this and I could grasp this, like really there's very little in life that you can grasp and hold on to. It is that vapor, which is the whole thing that we're going to be talking about in this book. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. Well, let's take a break and then we're going to march over to the word of the day. And, um, but first a word from our sponsor. Stay tuned.
Okay, so the word of the day today is meaningful. So Solomon used the word meaningless as he opened mm-hmm. Ecclesiastes. Everything is meaningless, completely meaningless. You know, I, I just kind of wonder what what he said, like how he would have said that. Everything is meaningless, meaningless, completely meaningless. Yeah. And maybe he said it a different way. I don't know. But but I just kept thinking, let's flip that around. Like, what does meaningful mean? Mm. What what does a meaningful life look like? Like, what would Solomon tell us? And um, and as I was looking at the definition and thinking through things, um, one synonym really struck me. So a synonym of meaningful is significant. Mm. What does a significant or a meaningful life look like? And, you know, Solomon should know because by world standards, he had it all. I mean, from the time he was young, he was destined for greatness and he rose to that greatness. He rose high. I mean, he even had the Queen of Sheba coming to say, yeah, you are so great. How do you do it all? And and so he was somebody who was very significant. And, you know, God intends for our lives to be meaningful, not in the world standards. And so Solomon was significant in world standards. Um, and God asks us to be significant in his standards. So it's yeah. not the world standards. So what does that look like? And 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 I don't know what's all meeting, waiting for us. I don't know what's all waiting for us in heaven. I can't even begin to imagine. But what I do know is now we are in preparation of mm-hmm. heaven. Now we are in preparation of where we are going to spend eternity. And so everything that we do here on earth will get used there. So what is significant when I am heading to heaven? What is meaningful as I'm preparing myself for the next life, for my forever home, my time with Jesus? And I just got, I so I started thinking and jotting through some things. And I, I memorize his word to know him better. Now, unfortunately, I'm not memorizing right now. And I was convicted by someone in our Facebook community who's memorizing it. And I was like, oh, I need to be doing that. I need to be doing that. I just don't have time. Well, I should have time, right? I Because yeah. that is a significant and a meaningful thing to do. Another thing is I read his word to know him better. We're all doing that. That's a significant and meaningful thing to do. And another thing is I steward the things that he gave me. Mm-hmm. And that's got to come into play somehow. Like what what you do with words, Trisha, you know that somehow God's going to use that in some way. Somehow, even my hobbies, I love doing calligraphy. I love making things pretty. There's got to be a way that God's going to be using that. How am I stewarding that? My love of plants and my love of gardens. How, how am I stewarding that? You know, what about the gifts he's given me? Do I develop them? Or do I squander them? You know, when we take, when we sit back and take time to look, we see that there is so much meaning in life and in living the Christian life, the life that God has given us with him clearly on the throne of our lives, there is so much more meaning. And so it is meaningful. It's a meaningful life, not a meaningless life. But Solomon is warning us as we reading through Ecclesiastes of the meaningless life. And so as, as I'm reading, I'm trying to put through in my mind, what do I need to be doing to make my life with God more meaningful? I love that so much. And it ties in perfectly with something I read on Twitter this morning, oh. in which I don't, I don't, I'm not on Twitter very much, but there's a couple of people that I have like get notifications to my phone because they always have these wise nuggets of wisdom. So Richard Blackaby, who was Henry Blackaby's son, who Mm -hmm. did the Experiencing God, which is my favorite all time Bible study. Um, But this is what he said this morning. He said, what wisdom and resources has God entrusted to you? How has he equipped you to be a blessing to Mm. others? And so just think about Solomon was entrusted with a lot. He was entrusted with wisdom. And then because of that, he had riches, he had fame. Um, But what did he do with that? He married a whole bunch of women and let them draw him away from God. So what if if he had had used those resources for God? Who knows how long that 
gold, those golden years would have lasted if he would have used what God entrusted to him. And I, and so just going back to exactly what you were saying, like what will give us a meaningful life? It's that seeking God, knowing him better, um, stewarding the things he gave you. So I'm going to read this again. What wisdom and resources has God entrusted to you? How has he equipped you to be a blessing mm-hmm. to others? So we talk about, you know, this meaningful life is not bound in the pursuit of world, worldly achievements or pleasure, but finding that contentment and gratitude and purpose in the present moment. Um, and he had everything, but it was really, he got nothing. Like he had nothing. That's why he's saying it's meaningless. And nothing mm-hmm. came out of it. And this book is Ecclesiastes is called Pessimism Literature. <laughs> So <laughs> it's like, oh, everything's horrible. Oh, Why no. is the purpose of this? And it says that um, this example from the Bible is, is uh, one of the only places that this, that this type of literature is out there in the ancient world, which is pretty interesting. Mm. Um, so some believe, again, that he he was really at the end of his life thinking of everything. Now I will jump ahead because I think this is important. You, you mentioned you read all the way through. I did too, Michelle. <laughs> it may be helpful at the end to know that he concludes with remember your creator. Mm-hmm. And so I think that is, and remember that God will bring us all to judgment. And so I think finally, hopefully, you know, you, at the end of his life, even though he's seen for all these bad actions, hopefully at the end of his life, he realized, God, you are what matters. So I don't want to give too many uh, spoilers, but I will just end with this last verse, which I think just ties up exactly everything that you've been sharing, Michelle. And that is Matthew 6, 33 through 34. Mm. It says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. Mm -hmm. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And so I love that. Like when we seek God, he will give us everything we need. He will take care of us. He'll provide us. He will give us wisdom and peace and strength for the day. Like Solomon had in an abundance and he did not use it well. But, uh, and sometimes God will entrust some of us with more that we can use wealth and uh, prestige and those things to glorify him. But all of us, we know that when we seek him above all else and live righteously and live right and use those resources that we're entrusted with to glorify him, he will take care of us. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. I think so many times we spend time thinking ahead to all the problems of tomorrow that may never come. And instead, like we have enough worries for today um, and just seek God, (laughs) just seek God, draw close to him and use the things that he has entrusted to you well. Good words. Good words. Seek God. I, and then we do. We need to seek a God above all else because mm-hmm. he is the only thing we have that will give us life and godliness. Um, we can we can search the whole world over and yet it's only God. And, and that's mm-hmm. what pa- Solomon is pointing us to. We, yeah. Everything else is hevel, hevel, meaninglessness. Yeah. It's meaningless. It's, it's only God. Trisha, could you pray for us today that we would seek God above all, all else? Mm-hmm. Dear God, first of all, I just come to you and I thank you for all that you have entrusted us with. I'm like no other time in history do we have access to your word. We could read your word. We could listen to your word. Uh, we could listen to podcasts of people talking about your mm-hmm. word. We have so much access, Lord, to your wisdom. We have access to you. We have your Holy Spirit living within us, Lord. And I know that uh, we, for all of us, it's only meaningful. Our life is only meaningful if we are using what we have, what we have access to, to glorify you, to draw close to in relationship, to point others to you, Lord. Um, all the things, all the things we buy and uh, organize and put in storage, (laughs) all those things, Mm -hmm. they are important. Um, But Lord, I pray that today you will just give us more of a heart to seek Mm. you and to seek your righteousness, knowing that you will take care of every one of our needs and help us not to worry or think ahead or, Mm -hmm. or ponder um, um, or be in that pessimism. Like, ah, this is nothing's, nothing's meaningful. It's all meaningless. Lord, I pray that instead We will look to you and say, Lord, because you are meaningful, because this relationship with you is meaningful, um, Lord, help me today to draw close to you and to live righteously. And we just Mm -hmm. thank you and praise you for all you have provided for us. In your name we pray. 
Amen. Amen. Well, we are sending you off with some daily encouragement to get into the word and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Again, if you don't have the one-year chronological Bible that we are using, we have links to that Bible in our show notes. You can even find it in the Kindle format. Also in the show notes is a monthly and yearly schedule of the Bible reading plan that we are following. And tomorrow we're continuing on with Ecclesiastes. We're going to read the rest of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, and then Ecclesiastes 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. I want to take a second here to thank the team at Life Audio. You would not be listening to Daily Bible Podcasts without their partnership. Go to lifeaudio.com. It's an amazing platform. Other great podcasts reside there. Other podcasts that are going to encourage you in your walk with God today. That's lifeaudio.com. And we will see you here tomorrow. Bye-bye.